we're going to move on uh, to our next session. I uh, want to thank all of the previous speakers who just joined us. And uh, again, as I said, we've got an action-packed uh, day, so we're going to keep it moving. Um, so we've reached our third group of research introductions, this time with projects related to human health and nutrition. Remember, if you've got questions, uh, pop them into the chat box. And anything we don't get to, um, we will email you after. Um, you can also, as I said, um, download our detailed agenda and abstracts from our website linked in the info session, section, which is just below that chat box in your media player. So first up, we have Tuan Nguyen from UW-Madison. Welcome, Tuan. Thanks, Maria. Uh, so my name is Tuan Huyn, and my lab um, study the pathogenesis of Listeria monocytogenes, uh, mostly as a, a human pathogen. But in the past year, we've begun to expand our work um, to understand uh, bovine Listeria infection as well. So uh, Listeria is uh, an invasive uh, foodborne pathogen in humans, and it causes about uh, 1,600 cases of illnesses, uh, foodborne illnesses a year, just in the U.S. And compared to many foodborne pathogens, Listeria is a lot more dangerous because it's not just confined in the gut. It can actually cross the gut barrier to get into the bloodstream and thereby infecting. Uh, sorry, can you please go back? Um, uh, can you please go back to the previous slide? And, um, and thereby infecting different organs in the human body. Um, in healthy people, the immune system uh, can uh, effectively clear uh, Listeria infections. Uh, however, in immunocompromised uh, people, infections could get pretty severe and lethal uh, with a mortality rate of up to 30%. Um, and in pregnant women, the steer can, uh, of course, uh, infect the placenta, cause, causing uh, late-term abortion. Um, so Listeria is a major headache in the dairy industry because many Listeria outbreaks are associated with dairy products. Uh, can... Okay, um, and um, one of the most difficult challenges of controlling listeria in dairy production is that it is such a ubiquitous pathogen. Um, listeria is a soil bacterium, and in a typical dairy farm, it can be found at almost all locations, uh, in animal feedstuff, silage, uh, bedding, uh, raw milk, uh, milk tanks, etc. And so not surprisingly, uh, dairy ruminants are frequently exposed to and infected um, with listeria. Uh, but uh, most adult cows tend to uh, tolerate listeria infection pretty well. Um, in susceptible and young animals, the infections can cause um, encephalitis uh, or circling disease. And um, this is lethal for up to 100% animals because antibiotics simply just uh, don't reach the brain very well. And just like for humans, um, the steel infection can cause uh, uh, abortion in pregnant animals. So uh, to begin to understand um, bovine listeria infection, uh, my lab set out to uh, examine the uh, uh, prevalence of listeria shedding uh, by dairy cows. And about a year ago, we went to a dairy farm um, in Wisconsin. Uh, this was a case farm uh, where an abortion confirmed to be related to listeria. So we took uh, fecal samples from 20 dairy cows um, to isolate Listeria uh, over a, a period of one month, and we followed the same animal so that we could check how often they shed Listeria. Um, what we found was that the vast majority of these animals that we sampled, 18 out of 20, uh, shed Listeria at least once um, during this period, and more than half uh, shed at least five times. Um, so we, because of the logistics, we couldn't sample every day, so we suspect that they likely shed more often than we observed. Um, what we found uh, to be also interesting was that some cows shed continually, even on days when we didn't quite detect 
uh, listeria and the silage. Um, this could be, uh, of course, related to our sampling strategy, uh, but there is uh, evidence in the literature that this could be due to um, listeria colonizing the animal's uh, gut and uh, get continually shed over time. Um, so, uh, to follow up on our uh, survey, um, we are actively looking at a number of research questions related to uh, bovine listeria infection. Uh, one, we want to know whether subclinical listeria infection affects cattle health and resistance to infectious diseases. Um, none of the animals that we sampled um, developed clinical illness, even though almost all of them shed listeria. Um, there is evidence in mouse infection studies that uh, listeria in the mouse gut can attack um, the gut microbiota. Um, and uh, a predicted consequence of that is that um, listeria may um, reduce the microbiota's ability to resist infectious diseases. And so we would very much like to, uh, uh, to ask an analogous question uh, for dairy cows. Uh, number two, um, if listeria can colonize the cow's uh, gastrointestinal tract, then we would like to understand the genetic uh, factors that allow listeria to do this. Uh, because understanding that um, will help us uh, minimize uh, shedding in the feces and um, thereby uh, reducing transmission within the herd. Um, and finally, uh, we want to know whether uh, the bovine uh, fecal listeria isolates that we got um, are a major food safety concern to humans. Well, if you're new to listeria, um, it's actually quite genetically diverse. Uh, it's not all the same. Um, there have been thousands and thousands of isolates um, from different uh, sources. And they are uh, vastly different in uh, virulence potential and their abilities to uh, persist in the environment, forming biofilms, etc. And in fact, uh, most of the isolates we got from the cows uh, are quite resistant to ampicillin, um, which is the primary antibiotic uh, in use to treat uh, human listeria infection. So we are planning to significantly expand our uh, characterization of these uh, bovine fecal listeria isolates uh, for different traits related to infection in persistence. Um, and finally, I have quite a few people to acknowledge. Um, there uh, have been uh, quite a few people in my lab who contributed to and are still working on uh, bovine listeria infection. Um, I would uh, like to especially thank our collaborators, um, Keith Posen, who is the director of the Wisconsin uh, Vet Diagnostic Lab on campus, um, and uh, Garrett Soon, who is also um, uh, uh, on campus. Uh, our different funding sources and of course the Dairy Innovation Hub uh, for currently funding uh, part of our uh, bovine listeriosis work. Um, so I believe that we're going to get questions at the end. Um, so with that, I'm going to end my presentation and um, would like to introduce you guys to uh, Denise Ney. Thank you, Tuan. This is Denise Ney, Professor of Nutritional Sciences at UW-Madison. I am delighted to have a grant from the Dairy Innovation Hub to further my research on the health benefits of a unique protein isolated from cheese whey called glycomacropeptide, or GMP. With support from the Wisconsin Center for Dairy Research, WARF, NIH, FDA, and private donors, we have been studying the health benefits of GMP for the past 15 years. GMP is a 64 amino acid prebiotic peptide found in milk within the kappa casein micelle. We cannot isolate GMP from milk. With the cheese making process, GMP is freed from the casein molecule into whey where GMP comprises 15 to 20 percent of the protein in whey. My GMP research story began in 2004 with a call from Professor of Food Science Mark Etzel who told me about his new method to isolate GMP from cheese whey. 
Mark also mentioned that GMP is the only known dietary protein that does not contain the essential amino acid phenylalanine, which we refer to as phi. Now this is important because individuals with a genetic disease, phenylketonuria, known as PKU, need to follow a lifelong low phi diet to prevent brain damage and severe cognitive impairment. Since the 1960s, all babies born in the United States and most of Europe are screened for PKU before they leave the hospital because if they test positive for PKU, we know we can put them on a low-fee diet and protect their brain and their cognitive development. After studies in mice and humans with PKU for a number of years, we succeeded in developing GMP medical foods. These specialized foods were commercialized via a wharf patent that was licensed to Cambrook Foods. This is a small family-owned company named after their children, both of whom have PKU, that is Cameron and Brooklyn. Our research to develop GMP medical foods has resulted in improved nutrition and quality of life for families living with PKU around the world. It's a great idea of what we call the Wisconsin idea on the UW campus. Next slide. Along the way, we had interesting findings from our PKU research, both in the mice and in humans. For the mice, we observed that the control or the wild type mice, those without PKU, and especially the female control mice, that they showed several health benefits compared to the control mice fed the standard casein diet. First, as shown in the slide, we observed that mice fed GMP had increased lean or fat-free mass and less body fat. Secondly, we observed the mice had bigger and stronger bones with an increase in bone mineral content. And lastly, the mice showed reduced systemic inflammation based on lower plasma levels of inflammatory cytokines. In addition, our human studies and studies from investigators around the world with GMP, they were reporting that people are less hungry after eating GMP compared to other dietary proteins. Additional human research is needed to investigate if a GMP protein supplement shows efficacy to treat obesity in women. The potential benefits of GMP include stimulate satiety hormones, making it easier to lose weight because you feel less hungry throughout the day, promotes bone health, and improves the gut microbiota, leading to reduced inflammation. With Dairy Hub funding, we will evaluate the effects of a powdered GMP protein supplement mixed with water to provide 25 grams of protein and 130 calories per serving. This supplement was developed for our study by AgroPer, a Wisconsin company. Our study will include 10 healthy, overweight, postmenopausal women 25 to 35 years of age. Subjects will drink the GMP protein supplement at home two to three times a day, keep food records, and make five visits over one month to the clinical research unit located at University Hospital in Madison. Volunteers will get free protein supplements and $825 for finishing the entire study. If you're interested in signing up to be a subject in our study, we'd love to have you. Um, you could give a call to Dr. Karen Hansen, my colleague, at 
608-265-8162. That's 608-265-8162. We are actively recruiting subjects, but we have paused our study visits until early next year. This is because the needed resources of the Clinical Research Unit at University Hospital are 100% committed to the AstraZeneca vaccine trial. In addition, um, WARF is in discussion with potential commercial partners to license a patent associated with this research for a GMP protein supplement to treat obesity. In conclusion, dairy products are rich in essential nutrients needed to optimize health. Americans, however, are unlikely to drink more cow's milk. My vision for innovative dairy research is to investigate dairy components such as GMP, but there are many others. These components could be incorporated into diets for individuals to meet specific health needs. In other words, personalized nutrition with dairy products. Thank you. I look forward to your questions, and I'm happy to introduce Rodrigo. Thanks, Denise, for the introduction, and good morning, everybody. I'm really glad that you are attending to our presentation session. Um, I, I would like to start going to the next slides, please. So during cheese manufacture and during cheese making, there are several biochemical reactions that will lead to the final properties of, of cheeses. One of those reactions uh, is, the is the proteolysis process. Proteolysis, in very simple words, it's the breakdown of the main proteins found in cheese uh, into a smaller units named uh, peptides and also amino acid, acids, which is the basic unit uh, of the peptides and also proteins. And this proteolysis is caused by enzymes that are adding to the, during cheese manufacturers, enzymes that are um, made by um, bacteria, starters and non-starter lactic acid bacteria during cheese making and during cheese ripening, and also due to native enzymes found in, in milk. What is, what is important to have proteolysis in, in natural cheeses? It's because they contribute with the texture and the final flavor of cheese. However, in recent years, Cheese scientists have been focusing on what's the effect of proteolysis on developing small peptide units that may have a certain physiolog physiological responses in the, human in the human body. And these peptides are commonly named as bioactive peptides. Bioactive peptides, in general, have a physiological and positive response in the human body and according to the literature, they have shown positive effects on the cardiovascular system, gastrointestinal system, immune system, as well as the nervous system. One of the most um, common activities that bioactive peptides has been focused on is, is in the study of uh, anti-hypertensive properties of um, uh, anti-hypertensive uh, properties. Why? Because um, cardiovascular diseases are one of the main causes of death uh, worldwide, and especially in the United States, where arterial hypertension is the first cause of deaths. Uh, for instance, um, there are more than 100, 500,000 deaths per year. Bioactive peptides from cheese however, can control hypertension by reducing blood pressure in people that may have problems with, associated with hypertension. 
that will lead to a beneficial effect on cheese consumers, but as well, it may have a potential impact on, on the dairy industry, especially Wisconsin dairy industry. Because we can not only focus cheese as a tasty product, a nutritional product, and a product that behaves well, let's say, in a pizza, where it melts and they have all these stretching properties, but also because it may have a beneficial impact on final consumers. But how these bioactive peptides interact with the hypertension? So we need, to, I, I would like to, uh, small, uh, to make a small introduction of what the renin angiotensin system is. It's an hormone system that is found in the human body, but is responsible of regulating blood pressure. And the blood pressure is regulated by one enzyme, the angiotensin converting enzyme. This enzyme has the capacity of increasing or decreasing blood pressure depending on their activity. People with hypertension have increased levels of ACE in their bodies. But the consumption of cheese with bioactive peptides that are found naturally in cheeses have the capacity of reducing or inhibiting the ACE activity and therefore leading to consumers with reduced blood pressure. That's why we have two research questions. Can we make cheeses with improved antihypertensive properties? And also, what will be, if we are able to make this type of cheese, what will be the effects of gastrointestinal digestion? In simple words, what happens after we consume the cheese? Because once the cheese is consumed, the gastrointestinal digestion will lead to further proteolysis of the cheese, and therefore we are not certain if these peptides will survive the, um, after digestion and then we don't know if they are going to be used or not. Next slide, please. So that's why we are proposing, we propose this research project into the very innovation hub, manufacturing natural cheeses containing bioactive peptides with improved anti-hypertensive properties, in which from the cheese making point of view, we are, we will be able to make cheeses using traditional and non-traditional approaches to improve the anti-hypertensive um, properties of cheese, as well as trying to focus on the nutritional side of the cheese by trying to place these cheeses under simulated gastrointestinal digestion models. We will basically will put a cheese samples in a chest tube and we will evaluate the what happens after digestion, in what? We will evaluate the inhibition of this enzyme, which will be an indicator of reducing um, blood pressure, but we will also evaluate what will be the effect of the, um, the capacity of these peptides to be absorbed by um, intestinal cell models uh, using a, a model system in, in also in chest tubes. So basically by trying to obtain healthier cheeses from the cheese making point of view and combining them with a simulated gastrointestinal digestion will lead us some ideas that cheeses are, health, are um, capable to improve human health but as well, it will be uh, further research will be required to study these effects in, in, in humans. So if we are able to make healthy cheeses, we will be able to improve the competitivity of the Wisconsin dairy industry in domestics as well as uh, export markets. This research will also be in collaboration with CDR director, Dr. Joe Lucy, and Associate Professor um, Brad Bolling from the uh, Department of Food Science of UW-Madison. Thank you so much. All right, we do have time for a couple of questions. Um, 
I'll give this one to uh, right back to Rodrigo. Um, do you think that it will be possible to have enough hyper anti hypertensive properties in a realistic serving size of cheese? That's the that has been the most uh, interesting questions that all the dairy scientists have been trying to to focus on. Um, there, there's according to the literature, there are several studies where they have found. Um, positive effects on consuming cheese regularly that have been also shown a decrease on the on, on blood pressure. But there are some other studies where they don't. Um, and those studies have been performed just by giving a piece of the traditional cheese. Our idea in here is trying to improve the anti-hypertensive properties, of course. And the first stage with the, our cheese making protocols, we will be able, hopefully, to obtain increased levels of these bioactive peptides. So I presume that it could be possible, but at this stage, we will be able just to determine that there might be an impact and in vitro studies. But as I said before, there might be, um, there will be necessary other type of studies in maybe rats at some point, and then further for in, in humans, but that will be further steps uh, on the research. So. All right, thank you. The next question is for Denise. Um, if the results of, uh, of this preliminary human study are positive, uh, what would be the next step to scale up the clinical trial and ultimately production? Um, very good question. If we have positive results, I anticipate two things. Uh, first, uh, uh, my colleague and I, Dr. Karen Hansen, uh, Dr. Hansen is an endocrinologist and MD, uh, we will take our data and we will resubmit an NIH grant in order to secure um, a couple million dollars in order to do a, um, a, a more long-term human study where we follow individuals with weight loss over several months, okay? Uh, that's the first outcome I would pursue. And then the second outcome is that, as I mentioned, WARF is, is in conversation with uh, commercial partners. There's a patent on um, this research. And it's very possible that a product could come to market you know, shortly after some positive results. This would be um, a dietary supplement. It does not re require FDA approval to be marketed as a supplement, et cetera. So those are the two outcomes. Submit an NIH grant to do a big study and try to uh, commercialize it via our WARF patent. Um, I'd also like to mention that uh, Rodrigo, is a, his research is a perfect example of what I ended with, personalized nutrition with dairy products. Here we're trying to make cheese uh, uh, a safer, a more healthy food, uh, potentially, for individuals with high blood pressure. All right, and our last question uh, in about one minute, uh, Tuan, would be um, to, uh, about studying listeria. Um, do you have to have dedicated facilities to study listeria? And if so, um, does having those facilities at UW-Madison give you a competitive advantage? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, my entire lab is uh, dedicated to studying uh, BSL-2 pathogens uh, such as Listeria, and we also have some other foodborne uh, pathogens on our protocol. Uh, we're well equipped um, to do um, mammalian uh, cell infection studies, uh, biochemical studies, and even radioactive experiments. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, we are looking to uh, develop uh, actually a bovine model of uh, listeria infection, which uh, doesn't quite currently exist yet. Um, but what we found uh, to be complicated from natural sampling studies was that you know there's there's so many complications with the natural microbiota. So we would really like to um, experimentally infect um, cows or young calves uh, with listeria and see how uh, that affects the um, gastrointestinal tract microbiota.
All right, thank you very much. And again, this is a rapid fire day, so we're gonna move right back, uh, move right on. And uh, I wanna thank these three speakers